Family Theater presents Ricardo Montalban and Paul Pacerni. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents Under Fire, starring Paul Pacerni. And now, here is your host, Ricardo Montalban. Thank you, Tony Lafrano. Family Theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family Theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. And now to our transcribed drama, Under Fire, starring Paul Picerni as Ben. I, I don't. Well, maybe he's on one of the back cars. Want me to go take a look, Aunt Jo? All right. But remember, Sam, if you meet him first, try to be as natural as possible. Oh, I see him. Where? On the platform up there. Oh, yeah. He's looking this way. Yo, Ben! 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 Oh, he sees us, Mrs. Taylor. He... Oh, he looks so thin. Oh, remember what you said about acting natural. Yes, I... I will. We, we won't even mention it unless he brings it up himself. Ben! Uh, ben, we're over here. Hi, Sam. Oh, ben. Ben. How are you, Mom? Are you all right? Oh, fine. Just fine. Nancy? Oh, you look wonderful, Ben. So do you. We thought you'd be wearing your uniform, sport. No, I, I didn't want to. I... Come on, son. We're all going back to the house for dinner. I've got everything you like, even your favorite dessert. Don't tell me. Icebox cake. I, uh... I shouldn't have said that about his uniform. I, I was trying to act natural. Oh, wait. It wasn't your fault, Sam. He just hasn't gotten over it. Yeah, I guess we can figure he's going to be a little touchy on the subject for a while anyway. Probably. Say, I meant to ask, uh, how come your brother didn't come down to meet the train? Well, Mike was pretty busy at the bank this afternoon. Well, so was I. But old man Peters let me off. We'd better start back to the house, Sam. Mrs. Taylor's planned dinner for six. Hey, wait a minute. Is Mike sore because of what happened to Ben? Oh, I've tried to explain it to him. Ben's his best friend. I know, but Mike says he went through a war, too. Then you'd think he'd understand. Seems to be just why he can't. He says no matter how you look at it, no matter how you try to explain it, it always comes out the same way. What's that? Ben's a coward. More icebox cake, anyone? Sam? Nancy? Oh, no, thanks. Plenty for me, Mrs. Taylor. Ben, you finish it up. Oh, I couldn't do it, Mom. I've been around twice already. Well, I guess I'll just have to throw it out. You will not. <laughs> you put it in the refrigerator. I'll eat it tonight. <laughs> Can we help with the dishes, Mrs. Taylor? <laughs> no, no, I've got Hannah tonight. You young folks go out on the front porch. I'd love to help. We'll be through in a jiffy. You go ahead. Ben, smoke? Oh, thanks. Oh, boy, that was a lot of groceries. Would you rather stay in here, Ben? No, no, let's go out on the porch. I'll fall asleep if I don't get some air. If you're tired. No, no, that's all right. I can imagine it's been a pretty hectic day. Why do you say that? Why, just homecoming. Isn't that always pretty hectic? <laughs> I guess so. Say, uh, have you folks got anything special on for tonight? Why, no, not unless Ben wants to do something. No, I just thought I'd stick around the house. Why? Well, um, I've got kind of a date, uh... One of the new girls down at the bank. <laughs> Which one's this? <laughs> the little redhead. We plan to take in a movie. How about you folks coming along? No, I don't think so, Sam. Do you mind, Nancy? Don't be silly. Well, I told her I'd be by around eight. <laughs> well, you go ahead, Sam. I'll tell Mom you got sick from a cooking. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm parked out in the back anyway. I'll go through the house and thank her for the meal. Good luck with the redhead. You sure you don't want to come along? No, thanks. Well, I'll see you around. Welcome home, Buster. So long, Sam. 
How does it feel to be home, Ben? Oh, pretty good. I'm still kind of getting used to it. We all missed you. Me especially. Really? You got my letters. You bet I did. You never stopped writing. You and Mom. Even after I folded up like a tent. Do you want to talk about it? Was that why Mike stopped? In a, in a way. He wasn't quite sure what happened to you. That makes two of us. I wasn't either. I'm still not sure. Ben, it's over now. You've got to put it behind you. I suppose he didn't want to come down to the train this afternoon either. He was uh, tied up at the bank. Mr. Peters had some reports to get out. Yeah, yeah, okay, I get it. Oh, you mustn't be too hard on him, Ben. Sure, sure, I know. Mike was a hero. Shot down five Japs. Bought a plane that was half burned up back to his carrier. You know he's never tried to capitalize on that. That isn't what I meant. It's just, well, remember how I used to get him to tell me about it? Over and over and over again when he first came home? You're the only one he ever would talk to about it. He knew I was just a wide-eyed kid. But I made up my mind then that if, if ever I got into the war, I'd be just like Mike. Just as modest and just as brave. Ben. And then five years later, I got my wish. <laughs> I got my wish right in the teeth. I got it. Oh, you're just torturing yourself. No, I'm not, Nancy. I'm trying to see what went wrong, what happened. Well, it's, it's happened to other men. But not to me. It shouldn't have happened to me. I'd been in the line before, about three separate times. I thought I was used to it. I'll never believe anyone gets used to it. Yeah, you try to tell yourself you are, anyhow. It was about a month before the ceasefire. Right at the end, our whole company was dug in along a ridge up front. But for almost two weeks, there, there hadn't been much going on. Then around 10 o'clock one morning, it was a Sunday, I think, about a hundred reds seemed to come from nowhere, boiling up the ridge at us, yelling, banging pots and pans. I don't know whether it was a surprise or what, but for a few minutes I... I just... I just froze. I guess I'd gotten used to the idea that, that, that I was through fighting. You know, I, I thought it was almost all over, and I... All I had to do was sit around and wait. Then I heard shooting and looked around and I saw our guys were, were starting to pour it back at the Reds. That kind of shook me out of it for a minute. I, I grabbed my own gun and started firing and everything, everything seemed all right for a while and every time I squeezed one off, I, I began to feel a little better, a little more like I was going to be all right. And I think I would have been all right if I... If what, Ben? If I hadn't seen this, this one Red... I'd stopped to reload, and I was, I was still pretty shaky, and the, the clip fell out of my hand. I bent down to scoop it off the ground, and when I looked up, there was this commie rifleman staring at me, staring at me from over the ridge. He wasn't more than five yards away. He had a perfect beat on me. I saw his hand tighten on the trigger and pull it. I was as, I was as good as dead. I'm not sure what happened next. I think his gun must have jammed because he looked down at it and he made a face and then somebody lobbed a grenade at him. It went off right at his feet. What happened then? Then? <laughs> That's when I did it. I threw down my gun and ran. Ran for all I was worth. I ran until they caught me. Then they shipped me back to a hospital. But didn't the doctor say you were suffering from battle fatigue when that happened? I guess that's what they said. Well, then? All I know is I ran away. And after all the doctors and psychologists are through with you, it's all anyone remembers. You just ran away, that's all. You've got to stop running sometime, Ben. I think I have stopped. I finally came home. I faced that much anyhow. What are you going to do now? I don't know. I haven't really thought about it. You've got a job at the bank, you know, if you still want it. <laughs> With Mike working there? Oh, what's the difference? You can't go rearranging your whole life just because of Mike. You know, that sounds funny coming from you. Oh, right. He's my brother, and, and I love him. But what happens to you is a lot more important to me than his outraged sense of honor or whatever it is. Oh, Nancy. Oh, Ben. Ben, it's been such a long time since you've put your arms around me. I, I wasn't sure you still wanted me to. Oh, I haven't changed, darling. Don't you know that? Yes, I know it now. You... You really think I ought to go back to the bank? 
Do you want to? Yes, I do. Then I wouldn't let anything in the world stop me. Oh, Mike. Yes, Sam? Mr. Peters wants to see you in his office. Okay. Oh, say, will you ask Miss Carpenter to pull the file on the Winston Realty account? Sure. You'll just have her leave it on my desk. Okay. Oh, um, by the way, Mike. Yeah? Have you seen Ben since he got home? No. I hear he's coming back here to work. So my sister tells me. Well, I just wondered if you'd heard. Yeah, I heard. Don't forget about that Winston account, will you? Don't worry, I won't. Come in. Oh, come in, Mike. Say, um, have you seen this fire inspector's report on that old building we've got the back record stored in? Oh, no, sir, I haven't. We better clean some of that stuff out. He says we're violating about four different ordinances. Oh, good enough. Oh, anything special we ought to keep? A lot of it's old correspondence that goes back more than 20 years. You can clean that part out wholesale. All right, sir. But I'd cull through the property loan and mortgage records pretty closely. Oh, for title policies and whatnot, huh? Yeah, anything that looks like it might come up again. Hmm? It could turn out to be a big bundle. If it gets too big, we'll microfilm it. <laughs> Good enough. I'll get on it right away, sir. Oh, I think tomorrow morning will be soon enough. All right, sir. Is that all? Well, as a matter of fact, Mike, there is something else. I guess you know Ben Taylor's back from the Army. Yes, sir. He's coming in this morning to start work. I'm putting him under Hanson in the personal loan department. All right. Normally, I wouldn't bring a thing like this up because I believe that one employee's personal attitude toward another is nobody's business but his own. I'm glad you feel that way, sir. Unless that attitude interferes with the proper discharge of his duties or those of the other employee, in which event... I feel the employer has an obligation to enter the picture. There isn't going to be any trouble, Mr. Peters. Mike, you and Ben used to be pretty close, didn't you? I don't see what that has got to do with this. But you think you're being altogether fair to him? It's not a case of fair or unfair. He quit. He he threw his gun down. Uh, Mike, I don't know what your experience was in the Pacific, but I served in France during World War I, and... uh, It can happen. One minute a man's a pretty good soldier, and the next thing you know, he's gone to pieces. All right. But what if everybody did that when things got rough? The only answer I know to that is that, fortunately, everybody doesn't. Because they don't let themselves. Mike, you can afford to think that way. You think I'm talking like this because I want some medals? You've got a perfect right to. I was scared to death. Every time I went up, I was so scared, I, I, I couldn't even think straight. And so was everyone else I know. And the fact remains... But they stuck. That's the fact that remains. They kept going up every time they had to. Then you don't believe there is such a thing as a man reaching the breaking point? Of course I believe it. But I also believe a, a man's got something to say about when he reaches that point. You're wrong, Mike. Look, I got the Navy Cross for bringing my plane back to a carrier after it had been half shot to pieces. I made three passes getting it down was on fire, and I was half crazy because when I came in for the third pass, the flames had reached the cockpit. Well, that last time in, all I kept thinking was, I've had it. I'm through. I'll never be worth another nickel as a flyer. I was right. But you brought the plane in. That's the point I'm trying to make, sir. No matter how close you get to falling apart, there's always a little something left in reserve if, if you really need it. I wonder. I don't. It's the only reason I'm alive. Maybe Ben didn't have that reserve. He had it. He was just afraid to use it. Well, as I said, Mike, your private feelings in this matter are your own. You Uh, don't have to worry, Mr. Peters. I, I won't bother Ben. I hope not. You can depend on it, sir. If he's able to live with himself after what's happened, my opinion won't affect him one way or another. Mm. 
And is that all he said? That's all I can remember. And he said he went all through this yesterday with, with Mr. Peters? He said Peters brought it up. I'm surprised he'd come home and unload the whole conversation on you. Well, I, I could be wrong, Ben. But I have the feeling Mike thinks he has to justify the way he feels about you. <laughs> That's rich. No, really. You mean justify it to you? Well, partly, but to himself, too. He doesn't have to do that. He's right. He is not. He's right on one point. If everyone threw down his gun, you'd have no army. Hasn't he spoken to you at all? Yeah. In two days, he said two things. No, one thing, but he said it twice. Hello, Ben. It's, it's not like him. It really isn't like him at all. You know, there's something funny about it. About what? The way he's changed just in the few days you've been home. You said he was pretty disappointed with me when he first heard about it. Yes, but it was mixed in with worry, too. He was concerned about you. He thought you'd done something wrong. But he was more trouble than angry. Then when I came home from seeing you the first night, I, I told him how you said it had happened. I made him listen to the whole thing. It made him furious. Well, I'm not surprised. Well, here's the funny part. I had the feeling after he stormed upstairs that it wasn't me or you he was furious with. It was himself. Well, maybe he just wishes he didn't hate me so much. I, I don't think that's it. In fact, I don't think he hates you at all. Well, <laughs> look, it's too much of a tangle for me. Well, here's the old homestead. Oh, isn't that your mother on the front porch? Yeah, come on in. We'll have some iced tea before I walk you home. Ben, is that you? Yeah, Mom. Thought we'd stop in and raid the icebox. Oh, hello, Nancy. Mrs. Taylor. Oh, Ben, Mr. Hanson from the bank has been trying to get you. What? At 8 o'clock at night? Yes, he was very apologetic, but he wondered if you'd mind helping out on some work this evening. Oh, sure. He says it'll only be for an hour or so. He was going to do it himself, but his wife came down with some kind of an infection this afternoon. Oh. I wrote down the address here. Well, uh, isn't it at the bank? No, he says it's over at the records warehouse. Yes, here it is. 1681 Prospect. I'll get you the car keys. They're right on the hall table. Oh. Yeah, I remember what this is. Is anything wrong? Hanson told me this afternoon they, they had a kick from the fire inspector on the records building, and he was tagged to clean out some of the old uh, loan correspondence tonight. Well? <laughs> the man he was supposed to help is Mike. Look, Nancy, this is nonsense. I'm going to take you home. Oh, please, dear, I'm asking you as a personal favor. Let me come along. Well, it's silly. I'm not afraid of Mike. It's not a case of being afraid. I, I just don't want either of you to stumble into something you'll both be sorry for later. Look, you told me the other night, and you were right, that I had to stop running. Well, that includes running from Mike, too. I know that, dear, I know. All right. So if he wants to call me a few names, he can go ahead and get it out of his system. That's not what I'm afraid of. I was a year in a rehabilitation hospital telling myself what a skunk I was. You were sick. You'd taken too much. You'd been pushed too far. All I know is they don't give you medals for it. Ben, listen. This is just for me. Maybe you don't need it, but I need it. I have to know you and Mike aren't at one another's throats tonight. For that reason alone, just for my peace of mind. Please. <laughs> well, it looks like you won the filibuster anyhow. Here's Prospect Street. I promise. I promise I'll never ask you for anything like this again. You know, maybe it's just as well you are coming along. Oh? I don't know. All of a sudden, I'm beginning to wonder who Mike thinks he is. I know. Say, that looks like it up ahead. Two-story building with the lighted windows. Let's see. The numbers on these other places aren't very clear. 1675. Yes, we're in the right block. Yeah, that place right across the street is 1678. Yeah, this is it, all right. Hey, let me give you a hand. Thanks. The door's unlocked. Oh, look at the bales of paper, would you? Wow. Now you know what happens to your old deposit slips. <laughs> Wonder where Mike is. Well, it looks like he was working at that desk for a while. Cigarette's still burning in the ashtray. Well, there's a flight of stairs there in the back. Yeah, up to the second floor. Well, I don't see any other doors. I guess that's it. Are you going to go through all these records? Good grief, no. You'd be here forever. Hanson? Hanson, is that you? Say, I had about giving you... Uh... It's not Hanson, Mike. It's me. What are you doing here? Hanson couldn't make it. His wife's sick. 
He asked me to come down instead. And Nancy? Oh, I just came along for the ride. Any objection? None at all. Maybe I can help? Yeah, what can we do? Looks like you've got plenty to keep you busy here. All right. Come on. See this stack of letters? Yeah. They run from K through Z. Have you ever seen one of our title insurance invoices? No, I'm not sure. Yeah, this is one. We'll cut up the stack three ways. Every time you find a letter with one of these invoices stapled on it, pull it out. The whole thing or just the invoice? A letter and everything. Good enough. <laughs> Look at here. What is it? <laughs> letter here to a fellow by the name of Kitsapopoulos. No kidding? <laughs> Mr. George Kitsapopoulos. Oh, isn't that grand? Well, it could have been worse. <laughs> oh. Well, they might have named him Henry Kitsapopoulos. <laughs> Will you shut up? No. I don't think so, Mike. I don't think we'll shut up. You came down here to work. I didn't. I came down here to find out what happened to the guy who used to be my best friend. You got a lot of nerve asking that one. All right, I got a lot of nerve. What's the answer? You ran, that's the answer. You dropped your gun and you ran. That's right, I ran. Because I looked down at the barrel of another gun that would have killed me if it hadn't jammed. You could have stuck, you could have stuck a little longer. I'd already stuck a little longer, Mike. There was one guy left from my original platoon, me. And when that gun jammed, I knew it was the last break I was going to get. What if everybody felt that way? I don't know. I just don't know. Ben! Ben, look, smoke! What? The stairs are on fire! Fire? The stairs! It must have been that cigarette! Oh, Mike, is there any other way out? I, I don't know. No! Now look, it's just smoke. The fire hasn't reached the stairs yet. Come on, we can still get down this way. No. No, the whole room's burning down there. There's no other way. Mike, come on! I, I can't. You've got can't to, Mike. Go it's the only fire. way out. No, I, I can't. Not come on, Mike, I'm, I said. I'm come on! Through. Let go of me! Where's the reserve, Mike? The one you were telling Peters about. The stairs. The stairs, they won't hold. Nancy, take his other arm. I can't. Hold on, Mike. You used it up somewhere, Mike. Is that where it went? You used it up bringing that ship of yours down? I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe like I used mine up looking down the barrel of that guy's gun, huh, Mike? Dad, we're at the bottom. All right, honey, cover up your face and get ready to make a run for it. The door is still clear. Pull it open as soon as you get there. You're all set, Mike? I won't make it. I won't make it. Sure you will now, Mike. Hang on. Hang on tight and keep moving. Okay, honey, shove off. How's the ankle, Mike? All right. Just turned it a little. My eyes are still smarting something awful. Well, keep blinking them. It'll give the tears a chance to wash them out. That's what I'm doing. I don't know how you can see to drive. I'm working with one eye at a time. <laughs> ben? Yeah? The fireman said there wasn't much left of the stuff downstairs, huh? No, but the second floor wasn't touched. I think we just lost a lot of scrap paper. <laughs> Hope you're right. I pulled a bright one, leaving the cigarette down there. Oh, forget it. It was a crummy storage building anyhow. Peters will probably give you a medal. I guess I deserve that. I was only kidding, Mike. I didn't mean it the way it sounded. Go ahead and mean it. Maybe it'll make up a little for what I've been cramming down your throat for the last few days. Look, Mike, if it's all the same to you, I'd, I'd rather call it square and drop the whole thing. I... I'm sorry, kid. I'm really sorry. I was wrong. About as wrong as you can get. No, 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 Mike. I don't buy that. You just saw it with your own eyes. It's not that easy, Mike. Tomorrow night, a guy might come along with a gun, and you'd have to lead me downstairs. I wonder if I could. You bet you could. Yeah. Yeah, maybe what it comes down to is this. That nobody can face everything alone. Uh, listen, would you two mind spreading out a little? Huh? What's wrong, honey? Well, sitting in the middle of this front seat's a bit cramped. Here, let me get my arms up around both of you. This is Ricardo Montalban again. A friend of mine recently paid a visit to the United Nations building in New York City. And while he was there, he attended a session of the Security Council. Now, this friend of mine is a hard-headed, practical man with a tendency to disparage the lumbering machinery of international diplomacy. 
He feels that problems of the world could be dealt with much more swiftly and efficiently if diplomats would just forget the niceties of protocol and get down to business. Well, at least that's how he used to feel. But after visiting the United Nations, he expressed real amazement that any international conference had ever settled a thing. It's the language barrier, he told me. Everything's got to be thrashed out so that the French understand that what the delegate from Siam told the Greek representative in English means the same thing to the people from Yugoslavia when it's explained to them by a Dutchman working through an interpreter. I'm surprised they can even come to an understanding on when to break for lunch. <laughs> well, as I said, my friend is a realist. And he would be the last man alive to declare that the challenging and in some ways terrifying problems which confront the world today could be solved merely by the adoption of a common language. But it is true, and I think our ablest statesmen realize that what is missing from the language of diplomacy today is a common vocabulary of terms. Words like honor and justice, good and evil, right and wrong, no longer mean what they used to for the sorry reason that a great segment of mankind has ceased to heed the moral laws which first gave meaning to those words. But the laws behind those meanings still exist. And there's a sovereign lawgiver to whom we can always appeal for guidance in understanding them. Whether we are statesmen or stock clerks, each of us will find Almighty God a willing and affectionate listener when we speak to him in his language, a language having the power to wipe evil and misunderstanding from the face of the earth, the language of prayer. It's true. A world at prayer will be a world at peace, just as anywhere in this world, the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you transcribed Under Fire, starring Paul Picerni. Ricardo Montalban was your host. Others in our cast were Irene Tedrow, Gloria Grant, John Larch, Herb Butterfield, and Sam Edwards. The script was written and directed for Family Theater by John T. Kelly, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program by the Mutual Network, which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lafrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to be with us next week when family theater will present Down Payment, starring Robert Francis. Anne Blythe will be your hostess. Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is Mutual, the radio network for all America. <laughs>